The link in the description is only there to see the source material. Do not under any circumstance go to these people with the intent to be a dick. I don't support witch hunts or lynch mobbing, so don't be either. As for the subjects themselves, my video is for the purposes of criticism and entertainment. Take care and leave it. My content is not here to start drama. Please do not treat it like it is. This video talks about some controversial and potentially triggering topics. Viewer discretion is advised. I have a story connected to my content for myself and my audience. If you're new to this and are interested, I'll link to a playlist containing the story thus far down below. Otherwise, skip to the timestamp on the screen to skip to the thing you clicked the video for. Alright, hope you enjoy. So how long do you think we have to wait for? There's no telling. Winnie, Valerie, and Annabelle just had to hold up until they turned the power back on. Not for nothing though, but Val has always been a bit of a crumb, so we might be in here a bit. It is a bit strange to me that we have to hold up at all. After all, we've had power outages before. What makes this one different? Apparently, we have a breach of some old friends who want to do us harm, which could mean a few things, none of which are particularly good given circumstances. We could try going over all the possibilities. Or we could just split to put the kibosh on this breeze ball. I doubt they're rugged enough to take on the four of us and it beats the squat that we're doing now. <sighs> I mean, considering the options of who our oppressor could be, that might not be the right choice. Tabitha might not remember the others, Karma. They were before she was on board. Oh, right. In any case, I do have an idea as to how we could find out without leaving here. Oh? Oh! That's actually a really good idea, Olivia! Poppy is small enough to go through the vents to scout ahead, find the identity of our mystery guests, and come back with info. She would also be able to find the other alts too and inform them. That's also not a bad idea. Alright, well, I'll be back. You all hold the fort while I'm gone, okay? So, to try and make a long story short, I have a YouTube channel where I normally upload or stream video games, usually the older ones and recently, to do something a little different than what I normally do, I made a commentary slash analysis on Zootopia, mostly for my love of the movie and to somewhat celebrate its 6th anniversary. The reason I'm bringing this up to you is because I'm aware of your style slash status of a slideshow commentator and how you occasionally talk about other YouTubers in videos you upload to the site. And I'm not sure if you take requests, but I would consider it an honor if you made a video where you criticized my commentary slash critique of Zootopia. Basically, and I'm not trying to sound ridiculously humble or anything, but I'm aware that my commentary critique of Zootopia had its share of problems, the main one likely being my own biases and personal feelings of the movie. I know that it's not perfect and I wasn't trying to aim for perfection. I just wanted to voice my personal opinions of the movie in a video. And I would be honored to have you personally critique my own criticisms. There are a few things that I should tell you. The original video is currently being disputed due to copyright problems b slash c the video was originally blocked worldwide due to using clips from Zootopia, even though almost all of them didn't use any or the audio as I placed my recorded voice over most of the clips. The 48 hour period passed and as of this message, the video is currently viewable during the dispute process where it'll either get ignored after 28 days, dropped all around or removed. So the TL, DR version is that I would love it if you personally made a critique commentary on my own Zootopia critique slash commentary. Here's a link to my channel. And here's a link to my Zootopia commentary slash critique video if you're interested in possibly making a commentary slash critique on it. Alright. How bad could this video be? I think that's a good start to this commentary script, don't you? I want to make it clear that I do not want this to become a habit. While this isn't the first time I've covered a video by someone approaching me to cover their content, and it probably won't be the last, I don't like the idea of being swarmed by video requests by people who might be insecure about their content. I don't want to be that person. However, I did have a lot to say on the matter of today's video, so let's just dive into the context. As the screenshot showed, today we'll be covering Came in the Skunk, someone who came to me in Twitter DMs at the end of July for some critique on his Zootopia review, and that's the long and short of it. He's been waiting a while, and I'm just now getting to it. Oh, but before I begin, I want to clarify to Cayman that I will not be talking about his Zootopia Plus review. Mainly because, one, I really don't want to watch a whole series for a second review that doesn't really change anything about the initial review itself. And two, everything I want to say would have been in the confines of the original review in a vacuum. You asked me to do this before Zootopia Plus was even a thing, so obviously I will look at it from the confines of that video alone. Anyway, now with all that out of the way, let's begin. Before I begin this video, there are a few disclaimers that I would like to quickly address. First, this being an analysis of Zootopia, you should expect spoilers as I'll be talking about a majority of the movie. Second, I'll be making comparisons to other Disney movies. When I bring them up, I'll put up a spoiler warning. Third, this video will have some occasional profanity in it. 
Fourth, this video is mostly designed for anyone who likes Utopia to hear my personal opinions on the movie, and I'm not trying to make this completely family friendly. Fifth, despite my research and work on this video, I might have gotten a few things wrong. I did my best for researching the topics for this video, but I don't fully know about certain things like what police work is really like. Sixth, I know that my voice might sound grain to some and that I've mispronounced more than a few words. I know that my voice sounds very nerdy and I don't like hearing it on a recording myself. But if you want to hear my opinions on Zootopia, you'll have to endure it. Finally, this entire video is my opinions and views and nothing else. You don't have to agree with my thoughts or opinions if you don't want to. Wow, this dragged on unnecessarily. Actually, I'd say there's a lot with this disclaimer that you just don't need, period. Like, to start, I can understand the want for a spoiler tag for Zootopia. That one is fine, and so is the spoiler warning for the other Disney movies you insinuate you're also going to be spoiling later on in the video. However, both of those disclaimers only really needed to be one point that could be an all-encompassing spoiler tag for the movies that you plan to bring up later in the review. Having two disclaimers basically saying the same, yo, I'm gonna be spoiling movies, heads up, becomes redundant. It's not the only instance of redundancy either in this disclaimer, as points 3 and 4 and points 5 or 6 both could be shoved into one point of pop too. Since points 3 and 4 are just saying, I ain't family friendly so I will curse a bit, and points 5 and 6 will be boiled down to, I may get things wrong in this review. Now, I'd argue neither of these disclaimers are very necessary to begin with, since cursing is basically a personal choice and would deter people who wouldn't want it to begin with, and points 5 and 6 are red flags because if you knew you got things wrong in this review, then why wouldn't you try to rectify that so as to not blatantly be building the foundation of your analysis on incorrect information? The only reason we're given for why Judy wants to be a police officer is because she wants to make the world a better place, which is a very cliche reason for wanting to become a police officer, as most people don't become cops for the same reason as Judy. So? Just because not everyone is enthusiastic to be a cop under the fantasy that the police join the force to protect and serve, doesn't mean Judy can't be. At the beginning of the movie, we see her as a child. There's a pretty good chance she was enchanted by the idea that what the police force does under a preconceived notion. Plus, she had ambition of being the first bunny cop, something that gets established early on from her family and Gideon. Also, just because something is cliche doesn't mean it's bad, it's the execution that's important, something you're not even going to touch on. Ananas. 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 Pineapple. Immediately after the Gideon incident, we cut to 15 years later with Judy starting her training at the police academy. The problem I have is that I'm not fond of time skips when they aren't used well, and we could use the in-between years to learn more about characters and get more development from Judy's early years. But why though? We've already established from her early years that Judy is stubborn and motivated to get what she wants. Even if you bring up how we never see Judy get the tickets from Gideon, her priority is still laid in getting the tickets back for the kids he took them from. There's not really much more to establish that'll really make a lick of difference to the plot in of itself. The point is that she winds up at the police academy. That should be enough, no? With movies like The Lion King, I can overlook it because we have the development with Simba before the time skip and with the midquel. With the fox and the hound, it wasn't handled very well because we didn't get much development between Tom and Copper while they were kids since they didn't spend that much time together. At least the mid cool that came out had more time between the two while they were kids. Hey, so I know these other movies were brought up as a comparison to mid cools that establish things better than Zootopia does, but you want to know something funny? I don't care, and honestly no one should for this review. Zootopia Plus, that TV series that takes place during the events of Zootopia, wasn't a thing by the time of this review, though it was a known thing that was going to happen, Kaman mentions it towards the end of the review, so we'll come back to this point later. In any case, the comparison between this, The Lion King 1.5, and, and Fox and the Hound 2 are frankly unfair at best, because you're comparing one standalone movie to two movies of pop and it's unnecessary at worst. Because what happens in a mid cool six years after the fact shouldn't really be something to consider when you're talking about the base movie in of itself. Nothing during the police training montage would lead me to believe that Julie would end up being the best student at the academy, especially after all the struggling we see her going through. Did you and I watch the same training montage? Yeah, she struggled at the beginning of her journey at the academy, that's undisputable, but we see her training and studying extra hard which leads her to do so much better during the latter half of said montage. 
Of course, it's a super condensed scene, it's a montage, but it continues to establish Judy's motivation and drive to be in the position she's always wanted to be in. The extra effort she puts into studying easily could have given one the impression that she rose through the ranks of her class. The mayor says that Judy became the first proud officer due to the Mammal Inclusion Initiative program, which feels like a very forced reason for why there hadn't been any rabbit officers before her. Why? You don't really give an explanation, you just say it's forced and move on to the next point. Like, first of all, it's not even that far-fetched of an idea. Affirmative action has been a thing for some time, dating at least as far back as the 1800s. So this idea that there was some discrimination against rabbits is a pretty realistic notion in and of itself. Something you're going to ask for a lot throughout this review, spoiler alert. But even taking that out, 15 years prior, in Universe, Judy's parents explained that there had never been a bunny cop before because bunnies don't do that. It just so happens that Markiplier Lion over there, during his run of Merrill office, signed an act that allowed her to do such a thing. Like, I get it's unrealistic for a person in power to do anything useful, but come on! This isn't that contrived of a plot point, especially since we don't know how long ago it was that Lionheart was in office for. Plus, it wouldn't explain why certain other mammals hadn't been on the force before. I'm just going to assume this is in reference to Nick being the first fox to join the police force, but that's an entirely different can of worms we'll have to come back to later. While I can understand Judy's parents being concerned about Judy's safety of her being a cop and going to a big city, why would they have their bias towards most predators, especially with Stu? Since we don't get much development with them, I can think of no reason before the Gideon incident why they'd feel racist towards most predators because we have no context for why they'd believe that. Okay, so beyond just the general notion that racism is in of itself not logical, Let's think about it in the context of what we've seen up to this point in the movie. Predators were said to have a long history with eating prey, and it seems believed that said primal instincts are within the predator's DNA. This is something even Gideon acknowledged in his confrontation with Judy. Considering this preconceived notion seems to have been societally ingrained, what with the kids learning about it, thus meaning the adults have to be teaching it in this little podunk town, it's no wonder Judy's parents believe it by this point in the film. On top of that, unless there's supposed to be cases of completely thinking in the past, why the hell would they think that foxes are mean because of their biology? We the audience understand the incident with Gideon Grey, but we're meant to believe that they think that all foxes are like him because of that single incident? Rabbits have other predators that would try to eat them, but acting like foxes are the worst because of their biology because of that one incident from the past is completely ridiculous. No, actually. No, we're not supposed to believe this is the only instance. First of all, they only use Gideon as an example of why Judy herself should be afraid of foxes, but that's not the only instance of fox racism we see throughout this film. Again, this is something we'll come back to later because it'll be more important then, but this really will come back as an important brick in this foundation. When she gets ready for her first day, she decides to take the fox repellent that her dad bought with her despite the fact that if she believes herself to be a real cop, then there'll be far bigger predators than foxes that she had to worry about. So? Just because there are other potential threats to worry about doesn't mean you can't keep yourself protected? Like, oh sure lady, you can keep pepper spray in your purse for potential muggers, but why would you do that when there are people with guns loose on the streets? Like, what even is the point here? This is not a nitpick, it's nothing. Judy claims that calling a rabbit cute is stereotyping, except for the fact that it's a fucking adjective. There's no reason why anyone would ever make the word cute an insult to a rabbit when it's used in everyday conversations. It can't be an insult because it's an adjective? Really? So are we to believe calling a fox in that world sly or untrustworthy or mean even can't be an insult either? I mean, hey, it's just an adjective. No big deal, right? Never mind how there are a plethora of other typically negative adjectives you can use to describe something as. Ugly, manipulative, smelly, dangerous, violent. And what if we took this line of logic and applied it to something that's not an adjective? Like, oh, the n-word is just a noun used in music all the time, it can't be that bad. Like, bro, what? Just because it's a commonly used word in certain contexts doesn't mean it can't even be the least bit harmful in the confines of the world of Zootopia. Maybe it's used in fetishistic or infantilizing ways. Maybe it's condescending. It could be a multitude of things that could be seen as problematic in-universe. If it's because cute is typically associated as a positive adjective, then I would love to see you interact with those successful Asians. 
those athletic black people, or those rich and powerful Jews. See where those kinds of comments lead you. Am I gonna get cancelled for this? Like, I'm trying to make a point here, but I feel like I'm dangerously treading that line into 2016 doodle territory. I hope I'm not going too far. But you get my point though, right? Like, just because it's a typically positive note doesn't mean it can't leave a negative stigma. All of those previous examples I gave do place that high expectation on people, and that's not always a good thing. Especially if they can't reach that high bar, and culturally, while we don't know in the context of the world of Zootopia what cute to a bunny means, we can infer that it's not something great. So to denounce it because it's an adjective, especially when placed in a real-world context, is, uh... Yikes! It's, it's not good. Uh, reconsider. Judy acts like it's unfair that she has to work parking duty despite graduating at the top of the academy. Except, being a new recruit, she won't be working on any of the more dangerous or serious parts for at least a few months, and even then she'd likely have a partner with her, even doing the parking duty she's been assigned for. Once again, I ask, so? Sure, Judy is a little ahead of herself, but that doesn't really equate to a flaw you can nitpick with the movie. It's a character flaw at most, though we'll come back to that later in this commentary. Like, it's not like Chief Bogo lets her do with what she's wanting, he's pretty adamant on the parking duty order, even going as far as to nearly fire Judy when she later breaks that order. In any case, Judy, while a bit to her chagrin, uses that rejection as determination to the best, or worst, depending on who you ask, parking maid on the force, striving up to write double the amount of tickets she was told she needed to write. So even if she is overly ambitious, it's not a fault with the movie. Unless the ice cream parlor guy is trying to ruin his business, then there's no reason why he turned Nick away as long as he was going to buy something while he was there. If word got around that he turned Nick away and Judy wasn't there to threaten him with the health code violation against him, which I'm pretty sure she's unable to do even if she does know a lot inside and out, then it's likely no one would ever shop at his place again and he'd be likely to lose a lot of business. According to the store worker, Nick was skulking around, indicating some level of suspicious behavior on his end. There's a multitude of things you can fill in the gaps with there, but self-sabotage is definitely not one of them. Plus again, the fact that he's a fox probably doesn't help because fox racism is aplenty in this movie. In fact, the guy behind the counter asks if there's any fox ice cream shops in this area, indicating a possible level of segregational behavior, telling Nick to go buy stuff from his own kind. Mind you, this is just another possible interpretation to this scene, but it makes more sense considering the broader context surrounding foxes and their representation in the movie. Unless Zootopia isn't as big as the movie makes it sound like it is, it's highly unlikely that Judy would run into Nick and Finnick again so soon after their previous encounter. Not if Judy and Nick stay in the same neighborhood or same district. I admit it's not entirely clear where they're at by this point in the movie, but you saying that it's unlikely is kind of just arbitrarily writing off something that might not even be such. That said, even if it was unlikely, it's not impossible, so at the very worst, it's just a happy convenience so we can move the plot along. It's literally a non-issue, even if we were to nitpick things. I might not know everything about being a police officer, but I'm pretty sure that Judy just can't go and threaten to arrest Nick for his scam because while it's true that she saw what his scam was, I'm pretty sure that she would have needed more evidence to arrest him or that it would have been a different department in the ZPD that would investigate his scam. So yeah, remember how I said the acknowledgement that he might get things wrong is a red flag? Yeah, that. Did you not even look into whether or not this is a true statement? Because I did, and while I'm probably now on a watch list for all my suspicious ways of asking the question into Google, I did eventually find a source that answered what the police can and cannot do, and amongst that list was that the police legally can arrest you without a warrant if they have probable cause. Now, for those who don't know what probable cause is, you weren't exactly alone. Generally though, and I mean this very generally, it's a requirement found in the Fourth Amendment that indicates that there was a reasonable basis for believing a crime was committed. In this case, Judy watched all of Nick's scam play out. She most certainly has that probable cause because she literally watched him break the law, or at least so she thinks, considering what Nick brings up in the confrontation. Alright, slick Nick, you're under arrest. Really? What? Gee, I don't know. How about selling food without a permit? Transporting undeclared commerce across road lines? False advertising? Permit. Receipt of declared commerce. And I didn't falsely advertise anything. Take care. You told that mouse the popsicle sticks were redwood. That's right. Redwood. With a space in the middle. Wood that is red. You can't touch me, carrots. I've been doing this since I was born. Regardless, she thinks she has probable cause. Thus meaning she could try bringing him in. 
Of course, the actual conviction itself would be up in the air as to whether or not Nick would actually go to prison for it, but I'm no lawyer, plus I don't really know how much I care at the end of the day. Why well, get that Judy wants to do more than just parking duty? She should know that helping the pig that just had a store robbed would get her into serious trouble from her superiors, especially considering what happened to Rodentia. Especially considering what happened to- You mean the district she chased the weasel into? Dude, she wouldn't have known about that part because her deciding to help the pig happened before the scenes in that district. Plus, I don't know how much we can really put the blame on Judy for what happened in the mouse district, because one, Judy actively cleaned up any mess that was made from the weasel's actions, no one really got hurt, and two, he would have used that district to hide from the much bigger police force that was on their way. Actually, on that note, how does any crime get taken care of in that mouse district? We never see, like, any small police officers, so... As for why Judy would help on a job she was explicitly told wasn't her job, did we not just establish that one of her character traits is that she can be rather ahead of herself? She wanted to be a police officer seemingly all of her life, and after having a conversation with her family where they explicitly mentioned that she's not a real cop because she's a parking maid, her jumping to that opportunity to prove herself is in character with what we've seen leading up to that point, regardless of whether or not she knew. Regarding the previous point, if the above didn't get her in enough trouble to lose her job, then agreeing to help Mrs. Otterton without making sure it would be okay with Bogo should have gotten her fired. It literally almost did. Chief Bogo was in the middle of firing her, but was stopped by Bellwether coming in. Please wait out here. Of course. Oh, thank you both so much. One second. You're fired. What? Why? Insubordination! Now, I'm going to open this door and you're going to tell that Otter you're a former meter maid with delusions of grandeur who will not be taking the case. I just heard Officer Hops is taking the case. Like, gee, I wonder why he wouldn't continue to fire her. It's almost as if the PR would be really bad. Why be racist? <sighs> Racism is small dick energy. <laughs> Nick's background for why he is the way he is feels really pathetic and lazy. First, unless it was meant to be a trap to begin with, where were any of the adults during the initiation? Obviously not there. On top of that, I don't know if you've ever been in Scouts before, but pranks, or in this case a trap like this, isn't too out of the picture. While I don't know exactly for sure how common it is, I remember hearing about them in my own, albeit pretty brief time, in Cub Scouts. Combine that with in-universe racism and a prejudice against foxes, and the actual prank itself, while harsh, is certainly not as contrived or unbelievable as you're making it out to be. There's also the chance that the kids lied about it being initiation to begin with, but that's a whole different interpretation and I really don't want to go off on too many tangents right now, especially if they aren't really needed. Point is, there's too many variables to just write this off as lazy, and doing so in of itself is pretty lazy because you're not trying to engage with the source, you're just adding unnecessary questions to dig plot holes where there weren't any. Second, it's very convenient that all of the other ranger scouts happened to be biased towards foxes and that there were no other predators that were part of the scouts aside from Nick. Third, related to the above, all the other scouts just happened to be prey animals that don't trust Nick for being a fox. Ah uh, yes, I too think it was mighty convenient for the KKK to be racist against black people. Fourth, how on earth did they manage to get their hands on a muzzle, and if it was from one of their parents, then why would they have a muzzle to begin with? At risk of being called a furry again, I can think of a few reasons why the parents might have a muzzle, but I don't think we want to get into that topic right now. Fifth. The idea of that single incident being the reason why Nick decided to be a walking stereotype is complete bullshit. Why? Spoiler alert, Kanan doesn't actually go into this, he just claims that it's bullshit because... Yeah. Also, Kanan doesn't know how trauma works, I guess, because I'm sure there are plenty of people who could probably tell you one really bad event is all you need, especially when you're a kid. Like, good god, that's the worst time to have a traumatic event like that. You're incredibly impressionable at that age. Sixth, where would he even learn about being shifty and untrustworthy from? The audience has never given any hints on where or who he would have learned it from. Well, the scouts come to mind, since they literally denounced Nick's pledge of loyalty and honesty strictly because he's a fox. 
Plus, given what we know about the world of Zootopia by this point, and specifically their biases against foxes as seen by Judy's parents, Judy herself in her younger years, and the elephant in the ice cream shop, as well as Chief Bogo a little later as you point out, Who's to say that he couldn't have just learned it from the literal everywhere else growing up? Once again, you're choosing to not engage with the source material until it spells literally everything out to you. Seventh, he apparently thought the best thing to do was to never tell anyone close to him like his mom or his unseen dad about what happened to him, so he never got any help and he ends up being a walking stereotype. This just in, you're lazy if you don't report your abusers. Never mind that we don't know if Nick actually did or not. I hate it here, on God. Eighth, smaller note, but if what he said about him doing his con since he was 12 was true, then where did he learn it from? Because we are never given any development between him and Finnick. So if he did happen to learn from him, when did he meet him, or when did he learn about doing his cons with him? This shit just flat out doesn't matter. We don't need to know every intricate detail of Nick's upbringing for the story to play out in a believable or interesting way. We know Nick is a con man. That's literally the gist of what we need to know meeting him, and he gets his development moving forward in the plot. Ninth, where the hell did he even learn about the stereotypes associated with foxes from? Didn't we just go over this point? I feel like we went over this point. On top of that, even based on what the audience saw earlier, Gideon was never shifty or untrustworthy with his scene in the beginning. He was just a regular asshole bully. And this is supposed to be a stereotype, so exceptions and rules don't apply to either of the two situations. That is not how that works. Stereotypes, by definition, are a widely held but fixed and oversimplified image or idea of a particular type of person or thing. They're usually spread by repetitious passing of social information, and that can come in the form of personal experience, conflict with those groups, poor mental or emotional development, or intrinsic biases passed down through familial ties. That last one we actually see presented in the movie through Judy herself. However, they are, in essence, mimetic and not actually based on anything true. Gideon being the exception to that rule doesn't really matter in this context either, because he's not going out of his way to be the stereotype. Nick is. So therefore, it's Nick's experience with the stereotype, something that we see throughout the film that actually matters. Actually, Gideon being the audience's exception to the stereotype could also be kind of the point, considering the theming of the movie is attempting to challenge the notions of racial profiling through stereotyping. And that could be a whole discussion in of itself, but this isn't my analysis of the movie, is it? It's yours. And finally, 10th, unless he decided to become a walking stereotype when he started his cons when he was 12, which is just a theory, then it's unlikely that he would become a walking stereotype because of that one incident. As someone who isn't very social because of some bad years living with one of my parents' exes and becoming more of an introvert, it would take numerous incidents with Nick for him to become shifty and untrustworthy not just that single incident. Oh, never mind. It's not that Cayman doesn't understand trauma, it's that any trauma that's not played out in a similar way to his own that seems invalid. Got it. Am I being too accusatory? Most likely, but I'm not doing it for the purposes of actually giving Cayman a hard time about it. There's just so many unfortunate implications throughout this video that I'm not sure if Cayman thought them through, and we're not even close to having covered all of them yet. I'm counting the time when Judy goes back home as not part of the case that I'm going to be talking about soon. The whole scene with Gideon Gray showing up again now as a good person and not an asshole bully like before feels like a very big cop-out. First off, it doesn't work well story-wise because we haven't seen him since the beginning of the movie and the 15 year time skip, so it feels incredibly lazy. Because heaven forbid we have off-screen character development during a 15 year time gap. Once again, Kamen also doesn't elaborate on this point either, so we're literally just being told it's lazy because it exists at all. Should just everything not on screen stay in stasis until we can see what's going on with the rest of the world? Like, friendly reminder that this is Judy's story, not a story about Gideon, not a story about Judy's parents. Judy. And since she was away from Gideon for that whole time frame, Obviously, there's going to be some discrepancy that we, as the audience, won't see. And second, because of the time skip, we don't know how he went from being a bully to a great baker. Hear that siren in the background? 
That's the film police coming to take Kanan away on account of the murder of media analysis. Well, well, if it ain't your mortgage. Here to remove you from this plane of existence with our ultimate strategy. The crime of apartheid? Okay, that's dangerously close to a nerve, and I'm a snail, so that's probably gonna result in an epileptic Armageddon. So why don't we just take the suspect into custody to be suspected of being suspiciously, 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 suspicious- Kanan, how hard is it to come to the conclusion that Gideon just- got therapy or grew up and picked up baking as a hobby during the 15 year time skip. What is this hatred you have of the natural flow of time being portrayed normally in a film? This is getting ridiculous. And trying to use that he had a lot of problems he got over as an adult feels like bullshit because he was a regular asshole bully back when he was younger. So people can't change? Is that it? Like, what's so unbelievable about some jerkass realizing that he was a jerkass as a kid? I'm a jerkass that realized that they were worse when they were younger. It's something people sometimes do when they get older, especially if they have a good support system growing up. Even with the movie mentioning that he had a lot of self-doubt when he was younger, it feels very stupid because they're basically implying that all other bullies are like him and that bullies have a lot of self-doubt when any regular person will tell you that most bullies don't have a lot of self-doubt and it feels hypocritical because the film is basically stereotyping bullies. Uh, where though? It literally doesn't stereotype every bully as that way. What? This is such a ginormous jump to conclusions that I think you were training for the Olympics. Gideon is one dude, and in fairness is the only explicit bully we see throughout the film. On top of that, if it hasn't been made clear yet, Gideon is still not the focus of Zootopia. His journey only sort of relates to Judy's journey because he attacked her at an early age. Aside from being the person to bring up the Night Hellers thing, he's only there at all during that scene to show that Judy's parents were able to push past their own preconceived notions and bigoted biases to help the fox. Perhaps even to show that Judy's earlier notions of predators having violent DNA may have also been canonical medical misinformation. You know, aligning with the theme of don't assume things of people you don't know because they're in a specific group. You know, don't be racist. That theme. Now that all of that is taken care of, I'm now going to focus on the problems relating to the missing mammals and the Otterton case. Chief Bogo giving Judy 48 hours to find Otterton might make him look like an ass, but considering everything that should have gotten her fired beforehand, like the Duke Weaselton incident and taking the Otterton case without being assigned to it, where he basically calls that action enough to fire her for insubordination, he's basically giving her one last chance to see if she can make herself look good or pack things up if she's unable to. See, I don't know if I agree with this insinuation that Chief Bogo was supposed to look necessarily unreasonable here. Like, I feel like you're reading the wrong things into the actions taken because the movie does not frame Judy's actions in a particularly positive light. It's way more framed as impulsive and dangerous considering the very scenes in the Mouse District that you pointed out earlier in this very review. Judy doesn't ask Otterton's wife anything about her husband that would help her case, like who he works for, the last time she saw her husband, or where he was going when she last saw him. She couldn't. Bellwether walked Mrs. Otterton away from the office just in the previous scene. While I understand that it's part of the joke, how likely would it be that there were no leads or witnesses regarding Otterton's case? It actually does happen, they're called cold cases, and one thing that can happen that causes them is a bad case of tunnel vision, where the police dismiss potential subjects due to flimsy, circumstantial evidence. As for a lack of witnesses, consider the actual scenario itself, where Otterton went crazy in the back of a limo in the dead of night. Outside of the limo driver, who we have to presume is hiding and not reporting what he knows to the police considering the state we see him in later in the film, who reasonably could have witnessed Otterton's feral outburst? Speaking of which, where did the picture of Otterton even come from? If it was from a person, then they likely would have been a witness to the case, so there would have been at least one witness. And if the picture was taken from a traffic cam, like how we learn about them later, then instead of a picture, there should have been a video that would have shown where Otterton was going, instead of her having to ask Nick about Otterton. Eh, that's really flimsy. First of all, the picture states that the image was where Otterton was last known to be seen. This does not mean that he couldn't have been seen elsewhere, but just that this was the last time anyone knew exactly of his whereabouts. 
Not knowing who to ask won't get you very much further than that, as demonstrated by what happened after Judy, who knew who to ask, asked Nick. Now, with this, to look at your two hypothetical should-haves, the picture taken by one person would assume that the photographer probably already has been asked, but had no information, since the picture was obviously taken in the daylight, whereas the event happened at night. Unless the hypothetical photographer was stalking Mr. Otterton, there's no way they could have known more than that. The traffic cam pic would also be more or less the same scenario, because the picture was obviously taken way before the actual event itself could have taken place. So while you could maybe browse through every possible traffic cam in Zootopia to find where he might have ran off to, it could realistically be a matter of time constraints or the additional cases popping up taking up resources. The latter being especially plausible considering Bogo insinuates as such. The How likely is it that Nick saw or remembered where Otterton went after he bought a popsicle from him, especially since he went missing 10 days ago? Well, he's kind of like a knowledge broker archetype, claims to know everyone in Zootopia. He's a swindler who works in shady dealings, so it's reasonable he tries to keep as many people as he can in mind. As for the how, I mean, he could just have a good memory of where Mr. Otterton went. It was only 10 days, and if he's got a good enough memory, then... Who's to say he couldn't remember? Especially if it was a particularly notable spot. I don't know, does a nudist colony count as notable to anyone else? I also wonder how he saw where he went, unless we are trying to present him as a stalker. Do you have a map of Zootopia? Like, how do we know if the Mystic Spring Oasis wasn't just nearby? Hell, maybe that's why there wasn't any other traffic photos. It'd be redundant to have that many cameras nearby. How would Judy not have seen the Mystic Springs Oasis Club's name before they went inside? The reveal is more for the audience than it is for Judy. Judy doesn't even make note of the Mystic Spring Oasis. Why is this even a question? It's completely irrelevant to the movie. Judy says that she can't look up the limo that took Otterton because she's not in the system yet, so she and Nick go to a DMV to look it up. While I understand not being able to look up the number herself, I find it unlikely that she couldn't go back to the ZPD and ask someone there to look it up for her. And I don't think Bogo would make it so that no one on the ZPD could help her as he just said that she had to find Otterton in 48 hours. I mean, I guess, technically, sure, she could ask someone at ZPD, but Nick was already on a hook and chain. Maybe Judy just thought it'd be faster to take Nick with her to run the plate. She's on a time limit after all. I mean, Kamen in this video really seems to be the kind of person to ask why horror movie protects just don't leave the haunted house and call the police. Law is meaningless! Stealing is legal now! The two find out that the limo is registered to a limo company in Tundra Town, but the entire thing makes zero sense. Instead of what company the limo was part of, it should have shown that Manchez is the owner of said limo and where he lived, because while the limo might be registered to a limo company in Tundra Town, They'd have no way of knowing where the limo actually is, and it realistically should have taken them a long time to find it. Manchas didn't own the limo, though. If anything, Mr. Biggs did, but it was parked in a limo rental service, so most likely it's actually owned and registered by the company that Manchas works for. In fact, in reality, if a limo company doesn't own their limos, then it's most likely a scam, which... Then begs the question of if Mr. Biggs owns the rental company, but I'm not gonna get into that, it's not important. Even if he did, there's no guarantee a CEO would even know what's going on, and really going to the rental place itself is the best option since they would know who drove the limo that day. I guess she could have waited till it was open to ask questions, but who really has the time when you're on a time limit and spent most of your day at the DMV? <laughs> The two learn about Manchas from Mr. Big and that he has more answers to help their case. I'm gonna keep this in mind for later. For some reason, Manchas never bothered to tell his boss about what happened regarding Otterton attacking him, like how he repeatedly said night howlers, especially when considering how many days had passed since that incident. My guy, if Manchas didn't tell Mr. Biggs what happened, then how did Mr. Biggs know? Like, in literally just the previous scene, Mr. Biggs gives Judy and Nick the info he could have, and told them to go to Manchas for more information. Otterton is my florist. He's like a part of the family. He had something important he wanted to discuss. That's why I sent that car to pick him up. But he never arrived. Because he was attacked. 
Remember how I said him acknowledging how he gets things wrong in this review was a red flag? Yeah, friendly reminder, I'm colorblind. The idea of Doug shooting Manches with a Night Howler serum at that moment is unrealistic and stupid. First, even if it was intentional, there's no way that Bellwether would know that Nick and Judy would be at Manches' place because she'd have no idea that their investigation would lead them to him. Okay, so... I didn't initially catch this in the whole note-taking process, but... Kanan is insinuating that Mancha's getting hit was because Judy and Nick were at that place in time, when that was never clarified to be the case at all in the film. Doug, as the hitman, never insinuates it to be so, neither does Bellwether, as the person who had hired the sheep to target the predators. So, Kamen is going entirely off this idea that the timing on that was purposeful instead of incidental, which, while you can try to argue is still unrealistic, it's only improbable, not impossible. So regardless of how unlikely it is, it's still an event that happened, so we just kind of have to take it as what it is. You know, bad timing on Bellwether's part. Even if she could use the traffic cams, she wouldn't be able to track everywhere the two were going. Hold on, wait. That's just objectively not true either. After the whole ordeal at Mancha's, they go use the street cams to follow the car that took him away, and they do a really good job at keeping up where the car is almost exactly. You know, if I wanted to avoid surveillance because I was doing something illegal, which I never have, I would use the maintenance tunnel 6B, which would put them out so even if we were to assume that Bellwether was keeping up with Judy and Nick on the street cams and that the timing wasn't merely incidental, she'd probably be able to do a pretty good job at it. Second, it almost automatically makes it obvious that Bellwether is a twist villain because up until this moment, she had shown to be kind towards Judy, so ordering Doug to make Manches go savage could have resulted in Judy and Nick getting killed. That makes less than zero sense. One, because at the point in time the Mancha scene happens, we don't even know what's going on in the film past the Predators are going feral. And when we meet up with Doug, we don't know who is calling him to put the hit on the cheetah. So to say that we should know by that point that it's Bellwether makes no sense, because how would the audience know to connect her to the crime to begin with? Because she was nice? Like, is that what I'm supposed to take from this critique? If so, then as far as that goes, it could literally just be as easily the yak from the Mystic Oasis. What a fun twist that would have been. I find it ridiculous that Bogo doesn't trust Nick. Why would he believe he can't be trusted when this is the first time that he's meeting him? Even if it's because of a stereotype, I can think of no reason for why he'd believe it, since as a police chief, he should be setting a better example for the ZPD. My guy, bigotry isn't logical. Also, are we going to sit here and act like the police couldn't be racist because they set a good example for civilians? Then you were not paying attention the past few years. Judy and Nick are able to use the traffic cams to find out what happened to Manchez, but considering that the area where he was captured didn't look like it had any kind of road, I'd find it unlikely that there would have been any cameras that were able to capture him. That's just an assumption on your part, especially since there's no basis for this. After seeing wolves capturing Manches on the traffic cam, Judy makes the assumption that wolves are the night howlers that Ireton was referring to, which makes her look like a fucking idiot since her theory wouldn't explain why the animals are going savage. We don't actually know by that point in the movie that the Night Howlers are what even the thing that made Emmett and Machis go crazy. We just know that Otterton was screaming about them as he ran off. Considering Judy and Nick found wolves who howl at night taking Manchas away, that's the only connection Judy and Nick have. On that note... 
Also, she knew the scientific name of night howlers, and yet she didn't know that other species called them night howlers. She surely would have heard the name between those 15 years. Not necessarily. Night howlers are a colloquial term, and is maybe not the name she grew up hearing because one, it might not be a term Bunny Burrow is familiar with, just in general. Maybe that's just not the regional dialect there, who's to say? And two, while she may have grown up on a farm, her focus was not farming. She wanted to be a police officer. So it's not too far-fetched to presume that most of where she got her plant knowledge was her family. This is actually insinuated through a conversation earlier in the movie after the Mouse District incident. Mm, hate to disagree with you, sir, but those aren't onions. Those are a crocus varietal called Midnicampum holocythius. They're a Class C botanical, sir. Well, I grew up in a family where plant husbandry was kind of a Shut your tiny mouth down! She only learned as much about plant husbandry as she did through her family that calls them by the scientific name. Hey kids, don't you run through that Midnicampum holocythius! Whoa, whoa, whoa! Now there's a four dollar word, Mr. H. My family always just call them night howlers. So no, Judy only knowing the scientific name for them isn't that unreasonable. It wasn't in her line of education, and the only time she'd ever hear of the thing being referred to would be through her family. Who, by the way, seemed to have not taught Judy what the flower is even used for on the farm. What did you say? Oh, kids talking about those flowers, Judy. I use them to keep the bugs off the produce, but I don't like the little ones going near them on account of what happened to your Uncle Terry. So it's doubly safe to presume that she didn't really spend a lot of her time helping around the farm and instead was busy focusing on being a police officer. I'm just saying, there are moments in the movie that can explain things when you just pay attention and approach it with the intent to interact with it on its own terms, instead of cinema sinning just about every little detail you can in the film regardless of if it's actually correct or not. When Judy and Nick find the mayor at the hospital with all the missing animals, a doctor theorizes that the predators are reverting back to their savage ways because of their biology, which makes her look like a quack doctor for thinking that without any proof to back up her claim, and she's likely been working with the missing mammals for quite some time. You know, this criticism being made after the outbreak of COVID gives really weird vibes. Like, yeah, heaven forbid the medical field theorize things as they're figuring it out. Right before Judy goes to talk at the press meeting regarding the missing mammals, she gives Nick an application form and suggests that he should be her partner on the force. This could work if this was expanded on more, but aside from her mentioning it while they were checking the traffic cams, there is nothing else that would imply that Nick had any interest in wanting to join the ZPD. Well, who's to say that it was explicitly because he himself wanted to join the force? Why would Nick, who had up to that point befriended Judy, explicitly need to show a want to join the force for Judy to offer it? On top of that, Nick wanted to be a scout and pledged loyalty and trustworthiness, showing that he wanted to do something good with his life before racism fucked his life up. So it's not too far-fetched an idea that maybe he's just willing to entertain the idea of being on that side of the law. I mean, hey, he can be corrupt all day, it's not going to change much in his life one way or another. At the press conference, Judy says the same thing the doctor said regarding predators going savage because their biology is causing them to revert back. This once again makes Judy look like a fucking idiot. First, she should have prepared for the press meeting better because it's unlikely that the press meeting would have been the same day that Lionheart was arrested. Second, theoretically, if the press meeting was the day after he was arrested, Judy likely would have been informed of when it was going to take place and she would have had more time to prepare for it. Third, it wouldn't make sense for her to just repeat what the doctor said without any way to prove it was true. She should have just told the press that all the animals were predators and that she had no idea why they were going savage to save face. So, there is a lot to unpack here. Let's start with the idea that the press conference wouldn't be the same day or that Judy would be better prepared for it. If it was the day after what they found, there's a good chance that she wouldn't have had the time or was instead trying to use that time to unwind. As for the former point, the marketing site Winger claims that press conferences should be held the day news is breaking because we live in a 24-hour news cycle, and if something is happening, it better be newsworthy. Whether or not this is good advice, I don't know, but it is something worth noting, I think, because this could very well be the general thought process of the ZPD in this scenario, especially since this followed the mayor of Zootopia being arrested. Now, for Judy relaying the information she had about the situation, 
My guy, you horribly misread what happened at the press conference. First, she said that they were not all different species. Someone had asked what the connection was. She said that they were all predators, and it was Doug that asks a leading question that leads into a panic, with Judy being asked why things are happening, and she claims that she doesn't know. But that there was a theory, and then elaborating on what she did know about the history of predators and prey. She didn't just spread medical misinformation on a dying because she wasn't prepared. She gave the information she had. These were not definitive statements. These are possibilities and working theories, which is something we've seen people do in real time, literally two, almost three years ago. Fourth, she happened to be carrying her fox repellent on her at the press meeting for no realistic reason. We still don't know the flow of time here. We could just assume she's had it on her person since day two of her being at Zootopia. Either way, she shows she still has a prejudice against foxes while Nick confronts her about how fucked up her press conference was. So, no realistic reason, my ass. Racism is real, my man. Theoretically, if the meeting did take place the day after Lionheart was arrested, then it means that she knew Nick for about three days. During that time, she bonded with him enough that the idea of her carrying the fox repellent on her at that time is completely stupid. If we were to assume that it was the morning after, then that means she's been carrying it on her person for two days straight. Because she's had it on her for day two and hasn't had the time to go back home, presumably. And fifth, I'd find it incredibly unlikely that the press conference controversy would get enough coverage that Zootopia would be completely divided over what she said. Y you're kidding, right? The mayor of Zootopia was just arrested and 14 missing people were found in his custody. What do you mean that wouldn't get a lot of media coverage? Plus, she just got through saying like what, a tenth of the population are genetically predisposed to become aggressive predators? If I wasn't convinced you were talking out of your ass before, I'd suspect it now. It's not like it would be the biggest thing that happened to the city, as apparently no one gave a shit about the numerous missing mammals, because that would have been the biggest talk of the town after the third incident or so. The mayor was arrested! Bellwether wanting to make Judy the face of the ZBD automatically raises red flags that make her look like the main villain of the movie, because she is aware of the divide between the prey and predators, and making Drew the face of the city would merely increase the strain between the two groups. Eh, not inherently. Because just before then, we see the impact that Judy made on Zootopia through the ZPD, moving Clawhauser away from the front desk in order for him to no longer be the face of the ZPD, showing that people more so fear predators than they did before. Look, I get that everyone calls Bellwether a lazy twist villain, and I'm not denying that she is. But your justifications for what makes her so obvious is clearly stated with a sort of retrospect because otherwise it'd feel like a reach at best. Nick and Judy are able to find Weaselton because he knows everyone, except he'd have no way to know where he'd be to ask him about what he knew about the Night Howlers. Unless Weaselton is often found in the same spot, pitching his bootlegs. Plus, they're not even on a time limit this time, so who cares how long it took them this time. This criticism becomes even flimsier the more it's used. With the reveal of Doug being the one that's been targeting the Predators on Bellwether's orders, then let's go and talk about her plan. Bellwether claims that she wants to spread fear throughout Zootopia, but she's doing a pretty shitty job at it. There are 14 missing animals, and yet the residents of Zootopia don't notice that anything is happening and life goes on like normal. You know, you said that earlier because no one was actively talking about it, but ultimately this is another pretty baseless assumption on your part since just because we don't see it doesn't mean it's not something people in the universe haven't noticed. I mean, the yak at the Mystic Springs noticed Emmett was gone for a couple weeks as an example of the contrary. By the way, on that note, can we like acknowledge that Emmett Otterton apparently frequented a nudist club? <laughs> the dude was a freak. On top of that, we don't know when she even started her plan to want to make predators go savage and cause fear and panic throughout the city. If we knew when she started her plan, then the audience would have a better understanding of how cunning she is, and specifically, if this has been going on for only a few weeks or if it's something that's been going on for a few months before Judy even joined the ZPD. That doesn't matter though? You can still understand that Bellwether is cunning from the fact that her plan wasn't caught on to earlier on. 
Well, unless we're going off the logic you gave, and in which case she was shady because she was nice to Judy, but details. Like, we don't need to know every micro detail of Bellwether's plan to get some idea that she is supposed to be seen as a cunning character. Now that all of those are out of the way, I am going to spend the rest of this video talking about specific parts of the movie. First, I'll go over the characters, then I'll go over the world, and finally, I'll cover the biggest part of the film, the prejudice, biases, and stereotypes. First, I'll talk about the protagonist, Judy Hopps. I need to get this off my chest. I don't think she is a very good character and probably one of the worst Disney protagonists. To start some of my problems with her is we have the time skip that occurs after the incident with Gideon Gray that skips 15 years, which I'm not very fond of when it's not handled well. So, okay. Let's ignore how the time skip is handled in a way that does just fine at giving us the information we actually need moving forward into the movie. We'll go off this idea that Judy's training montage isn't that great and shows us nothing. How does that actually affect her character, though? It's along the same scope of I think this character is bad because they play like shit or have too many voice lines. It seems more like a complaint over the media you're consuming overall over a problem with their characters alone. It's not to say that you can't have problems with that aspect of whatever movie or video game you're discussing, but it's not really a good criticism of the character themselves and what the character does. A small rant about time skips in Disney movies incoming. As I mentioned earlier, it works in The Lion King because we got a lot of development with Simba before we see him as an adult. In something like The Fox and the Hound, I don't think it worked very well because we don't get a lot of time with Todd and Copper while they're kids barely 10 minutes together. While it definitely had its problems, at least the Midkle had more time between the two of them so they got more development. It works in Wreck-It Ralph because being video game characters, they're not shown to age like real people, and since we hadn't gotten any prior development with any of the characters, it also works with the eventual reveal of the villain. It's probably the best villain reveal with Coco's reveal being a good second best the way it was set up. Anyway, getting back to Judy again. Am I developing easily bored syndrome, or did this guy really not make a point about time skips and just went off on a tangent for no reason? Ugh, why? You actually could have made a point that would further along your stance on time skips, but instead you just give us three examples of other time skips that you think do or don't work for, ultimately arbitrary reasons. And I do mean arbitrary, because time skips are supposed to condense a frame of time for the story to progress in a timely manner without having to see all the unnecessary growth the characters have to go through. They don't really require a ton of pre-time skip development to really get the point across. For instance, we can use Up, which has an absolutely iconic time skip seen pretty early on in the movie where we can see Carl and Ellie's relationship flourish until Ellie's departure from life. It established what the relationship was like even without giving us a third of the movie with them. With Fox and the Hound, the build up to the time skip is that two kids have just met and befriended each other, which is literally something I did when I was younger. Then Copper goes off on a hunting trip until the spring, where the two new friends realize that they can't see each other for some time. Their kids by the way, people who get very attached to things very fast. The time away from each other is to show that people can change with environment, upbringing, and distance because they're only away from each other during that winter, and as they return to each other, Todd notices Copper has. The time of development before the time skip doesn't matter as much because the development of them as children isn't really that important to the story being told after the time skip. You just need to know their friends, and that friendships can break off after a period of time. Bringing up Fox and the Hound 2 is frankly even worse, because it's an active retcon to the story of the first one. The time away from Todd and Copper is imperative to the story. It is the main thing the story points out to you, and Fox and the Hound 2 spits in the face of that by having Todd and Copper together for the entire film. Considering that plot as canon to the first movie makes no sense when you consider the change was caused by the distance between the two. Wreck-It Ralph's time skip, on the other hand, isn't important at all. It's literally just used to set up the setting of the arcade. It doesn't really do anything else you say it does here. Next, she believes that she should be able to work on one of the missing mammal cases right away despite being a new recruit and that it would take her at least a few months before she'd be allowed to work on any of the missing mammal cases. 
She tries to argue that she should work on one of those cases because she was top of her class at the academy, which makes her look very entitled because being at the top of the academy doesn't mean jack or shit when it comes to police work. Citation needed. I cannot find anything supporting nor debunking this claim, so unless you got a source, this one is just being told to us at face value. On that note, I don't know if you guys remember I said this was going to be important later, but now is later. Let's talk about this potential character flaw from the perspective of the film, because there's some notes here in the movie that might frame some of Judy's go-getter attitude in a much more interesting light than you would think. Like, understand that she is the first bunny cop on the force. Prior to her, bunnies just didn't do work on the lines of the police force. It took affirmative action to even get one on the force, meaning there's a good chance that bunnies were discriminated against from even joining the force to begin with. And with such prejudice in mind, Bogo giving Judy meter mate duty while saying things like, Do you think the man asked what I wanted when he assigned you to me? But sir, if Life isn't some cartoon musical where you sing a little song and your insipid dreams magically come true. So let it go. When in the face of Judy stating that she wants more important work, it does kind of give a new perspective on why she'd get so far ahead of herself. She wasn't even introduced as a new cop on the job, it was totally glossed over. She wants to prove herself as someone who can handle the work that she signed up to do. So, while at worst it is a character flaw, it doesn't make her a bad character when you consider the world that she was given to be in. One where both predators and prey are, quite frankly, incredibly prejudiced. She also proves that she shouldn't be a cop because she doesn't follow orders while on the job, she is very impulsive, she took the Otterton case which as Bogo pointed out was straight up insubordination and it should have gotten her fired then and there. Okay, out of everything that I have to say about this review, slight nitpick. But the insubordination that Judy did wasn't taking the Otterton case, it was catching the weasel while on meter mate duty. She wasn't told that she couldn't take the case at the time, so therefore, offering to help with the case wasn't strictly disobeying orders. Then she blackmails Nick into helping her with the Otterton case, even after he told her where he saw Otterton last, and she uses him to investigate the limo where Otterton was last seen. I got a joke, but I think I'll keep it to myself. In the Tame Collar version, Judy works better because in that version, She's a rookie cop like in the final version, but the main difference is that she would have been the deuteragonist while Nick would have been the protagonist. It would have worked in that version because not only is she the fish out of water that doesn't know much about Zootopia, but she also doesn't know what predators like Nick have to go through. And later on, she's still able to be very helpful with Nick and the overall plot, which I'll go over once I've gone over the rest of the characters. That said, I do have words for this. Next, I'm going to talk about Nick Wilde. As I just mentioned, he was meant to be the protagonist in the movie instead of Judy, and it really shows. Unlike the other version, he has almost no development here. Even with his background, it comes off as completely unrealistic and illogical with him never telling anyone about the incident and never getting any help for it, and we don't learn how he became a con man. Yes, because racism and discrimination in groups do not exist. People not vocalizing their trauma out of fear never happens. Things happening off screen never happens in media ever. We need to know every little detail about everything in film even if it doesn't matter because our head meat cannot logically fill in the gaps to things we do not see. I am so tired. It also fails to explain his relationship with Finnick since they're supposed to be partners in crime and yet the two barely have any time together aside from the popsicle scam and when Judy is looking for him for clues on her case. Because Fennec doesn't really matter to the story. We'll get back to that in a bit. The movie also makes him Judy's partner at the end, something that I hated solely because there are no signs that he had any interest in wanting to become a cop even in the Tame Collar version, and it just feels very forced on. Oh my god. He and Judy developed a friendship over the past few days, and she offered to which he accepted. If you're upset by him accepting a friendly gesture in a world where otherwise they'd be expected to hate each other, especially emphasized by how foxes are treated in the world of Zootopia, then frankly, you just don't get it. 
I'm going to go over his role in the previous version after I've gone over the last character I want to talk about, the villain Bellwether. Before I get to her, I want to first go over a few other characters like Judy's family, Gideon, and Phoenix, since I'll be saving her as the last one. I'm gonna go ahead and cover the bunnies and Gideon points at once because it's just more or less repeated points that I've already covered that get elaborated on a little bit, but not really enough to justify continuing to restate all of the counter arguments I've previously made individually. So, to go over to what's being said during this portion, his points of Judy's parents regard their lack of development, specifically in regards to their racism and working with Gideon, though he does continue to say that the siblings are worse in this regard, to which he says, While they didn't get much development in the Tame Collar version, after Judy and Nick escaped from Manchez who had gone savage, and yes, Manchez was taken from this version, after becoming unconscious, Nick wakes up in Judy's home in Bunnyboro, surrounded by many of her siblings who had never seen a fox before. They also feel that he was a hero for saving Judy from someone earlier. It's not an awful lot, but at least the siblings have actual development here than compared to the final version. Which I'd hardly call it development, because by the sounds of it they only get one scene, so there's nothing to develop on in accordance with your own statements. And his point against Gideon is that there just wasn't enough development of him being a bully, as well as the whole self-doubt thing where he claims the movie stereotypes bullies, which... Fucking no. Fennec the Fennec Fox really ended up getting the short end of the stick when it came to development. At least Bogo and Clawhauser had decent development, but Finnick gets less screen time than the latter, and he wasn't even in the movie for that long. I love how the wording here sounds almost like you're saying that Finnick gets less development despite being in the movie less. Because like, yes, Cayman, characters do get less development when they're in the movie less. In other news, people die when they're killed. Alright, back to the point. So, first of all, Chief Bogo getting more development makes sense because he's a secondary character over Fennec's tertiary status. But Clawhauser gives about as much development as Fennec gets, being not a lot. What do you mean? Like, generally, it almost feels like you're using character development as a buzzword here to describe character quality, because Fennec and Clawhauser don't get development, they're not supposed to. They are merely tertiary characters that are used to forward along a story when they're needed, and flesh out the world a bit used in a similar vein to background characters when they're not. We get a grand total of three scenes with him. When he helps Nick with his popsicle scam, only talking briefly at the end of it, when Judy is trying to find Nick so that he can help her with the Otterton case, and when Judy happens to run into his van while she's looking for Nick, getting in three words. And yet you wonder why he got less development than Chief Bogo. Hmm. Strange that. The worst part is that if Finnick had any development off screen, Cayman would complain about that being an asshole though. Is that right, Gideon? In the Tame Collar version, his screen time was going to be far greater than what he gets in the final version. He was still going to be a supporting character, but at least he would have gotten far more development than what he gets here. Such as? So, this becomes a problem with Cayman's video moving forward. He keeps bringing up this thing known as Zootopia Wild Times at the Tame Caller, which is supposed to be Zootopia's beta run. There's a link to the compiled version of it came in calls to by one Will Phantom Mini down below. I've got thoughts and opinions about this version, but we'll come back to those later. But Cayman is going to start calling to this version a lot going forward, but rarely actually elaborates on what about this version is important to his points. Such as here, where he talks about Fennec's role in the Tame Collar version being something that's better than his role in the final version of Zootopia we got. Unless you know anything about the Tame Collar version, you're most likely not going to know what that role is in the film and how it's better. Whee! I'm going to go into some spoilers for the Tame Collar version regarding the villain. I figure it doesn't really matter that much since it's unlikely that Disney is going to do shit with it, but you've been warned. Originally, the villain was going to be the mayor of Zootopia, Swinton a pig. From what I heard, the logic was that she's the villain because pigs are one of the smartest animals on the planet, so they basically didn't want to hold the audience's hands and they wanted to show how clever they were. Again, this may be me, me being petty, but while you are right in that the pig was chosen because it's one of the most intelligent animals, I don't think it was chosen with the intent to be clever about it, it just seems... Maybe not circumstantial, but 
basically not what you're claiming. That said, I'll come back to this claim in a bit. Unlike Bellwether, her reveal of being the villain would have come sooner, but even though we learned she's the villain, they couldn't take her down then and there due to being the mayor of the city and needing more evidence to convict her. I'm going to go into more details with her when I talk about the world of Zootopia and stereotypes, but basically not only was she far more cunning than Bellwether, but she was also far more racist than her. She was also able to keep herself more calm and collected than Bellwether. I see no evidence supporting that claim. Instead though, they dropped her as mayor and had her replaced with Lionheart, giving way to more stereotypes, the third lion as the king leader after Prince John and Mufasa, and we were given Bellwether as the assistant mayor, and here we are. I don't mind twist villains if they're done right or given enough development to have their plans make sense. They did neither with Bellwether and she should have been cut from the final film and had the focus be on Nick and what he had to go through in Zootopia. Ah uh, yes, I agree. We totally should have had the fan fiction eugenics cut where we get bludgeoned over the head every five minutes and how prey are privileged and bad and predators are impoverished and should have sympathy. More on that later. In any case, Bellwether and Swinton aren't even that much different by your own words. So even if we got the story surrounding what Nick goes through in Zootopia, going off the tame collar version, we would still need a racially driven antagonist to really move the plot along. Unless you're trying to tell us that we should have a Martin Luther King Jr. story with Nick as the center focus. That actually might be really funny. Nick Wilde doing the I Have a Dream speech is like a visual that like is both powerful and absurd. I, I kind of want to see that now. Speaking of which, I'm going to go over the world of Zootopia and the racism, stereotypes, etc. of both the Tane Collar version but also the final version. Considering how we've heard you approach the topic leading up to this point, I can't wait to see how this goes! I feel that they didn't show us enough in the final version. We practically saw none of Sahara Square, unless you count the Mystic Springs Oasis scene, which I don't count since it was just one location in the district. It's pretty much the same situation with Tundra Town since all we saw was the Limola and Mr. Big's place. The place we saw the most of, aside from the main part of the city itself, was the Rainforest District, which even then doesn't mean much because the scene almost copies everything that was used in a similar scene in the Tame Collar version. I won't deny that it would be nice to see more of these places, but to be honest, it wouldn't really make that much of a difference considering the people in this bunny cop story are way more important than the places. And frankly, even in the Tame Collar version, we don't really need to see most of the places we do, because it's not the places that move along the story. The locations are ultimately arbitrary at the end of the day, you know, barring wild times. In the final version, we don't see a lot of the districts, and we don't see much of Bunnyboro. We don't even see what Judy's house looks like, while we got a good idea of what it looked like in the Tame Collar version. If the movie had gone and used the other version, then we would have seen far more locations than what we see in the final film. But for why? Speaking of which, now I'm going to dive deep into the Tame Collar version. The original version works a bit like the final version, where thousands of years ago, predators would eat prey animals. Thousands of years ago. The world was a different place. A place where everybody was naked. ...were divided into two groups. Predators with the sharp teeth and prey with the flat teeth. And why weren't we friends? Mmm, Finnick. Cause we wouldn't share clothes. Because predators would eat us. <laughs> but just to be extra safe, we have the tame collar. When a predator gets agitated, the tame collar reminds them to be good. So now, all mammals can be together. At some point, to make sure that nothing like that ever happened again, the tame collar was created, which would give predators a shock if they ever got agitated, to keep them under control, and so fights wouldn't break out. As one might imagine, while the idea seems decent enough, there are obvious problems with it, mainly the idea of thinking that it would automatically keep things peaceful between the two groups, 
but almost any possible sign of aggression would be enough to give a predator a shock from the collar. Jesus fucking Christ, are we really doing this with a copy of the movie that does not exist? You know what, no, I'm not doing this. This review is way too long and droned on as it is, and this entire tangent does not actually matter at the end of the day, because if it's not continued Cinema Sins level nitpicks where he wishes things were just spelled out in the most explicitly no-nuanced way it could, he's just going over the plot to the Tang Collar version while making really bad comparisons between racism and classism. The world of Zootopia reminds me a lot of Agrabah from Aladdin. There are many differences between the two worlds, but basically, if you weren't living in the palace, a royal guard, or a merchant, or a craftsman, you were basically struggling like Lan was, and he often had to steal food to survive. He and others like him were often called street rats. For a better example of a place that's similar to Zootopia, let's take the world of Wreck-It Ralph. While the world itself is not much like Zootopia, the situations of the main characters, Ralph and Vanellope, are pretty close to the racism of Zootopia. Which if I can be blunt, no. For Aladdin, royal sultanate ran governments and racism are different things, because the former is predicated on a level of classism that favors a single family or person to rule a kingdom, whereas the other is just racism, specific discrimination towards an entire group of people. Sure, someone gets put in a worse position no matter which way you slice it, but one stems from bigotry, whereas the other is nepotism which ultimately make them two different things. Whereas in Wreck-It Ralph, it's a bit more complicated than that. Ralph is the villain of his game. His role is to destroy the homes of those who live there, so obviously the civilians in Fix-It Felix are going to be more against him. It's his actions that lead to his negative stigma, and while yeah, that's just Ralph doing his job, considering all of the other villains we see throughout the movie, it's safe to assume he's not the only one. As for Vanellope, she's glitching out in the movie. This just does not work as a comparison on any level. She was an active danger to the game she was in and thus was outcasted on that basis, not helped by Turbo's takeover of Sugar Rush that also painted Vanellope in a much worse light. She was a victim of circumstance, but that's not racism. She was an active danger to those around her. If you're just saying that the situations are similar because they're outcasts, Aladdin isn't an outcast. He's a pedestrian amongst other poorer pedestrians, and Ralph and Vanellope's circumstances are just different to Nick's. To say that they're similar because they're outcasts misses the point. So yeah, beyond that, this segment is getting skipped outright. I have no intentions on going through the plot overview of the Tame Collar version, especially since Cayman doesn't make any more points of note during this portion beyond what I've already covered. <laughs> In Zootopia's final version, the Tang Collars were removed and they instead used stereotypes and biases. The problem though is that unless you know what you're doing, it can be really hard to pull off and in this movie's case, they didn't pull it off because there's not enough development with the characters and some of what they use for backstories with Judy and Nick don't feel remotely believable because of what was presented in this movie. Really? We're back to the unrealism of the furry bunny cop movie? Look, I've already touched on how much you seem to ignore regarding what was actually in those backstories, and I'm not gonna say that Zootopia's allegory isn't the least bit confused, because it is. Prey, who are a majority of the population in accordance to Bellwether, are looked down upon and have never been on the police force, but predators are the minority that people have to trust less due to their violent DNA. It seemed like this movie wanted its cake and eat it too. But that's where the allegory fails, not the backstories presented in the movie we got. Especially regarding the time skip because it causes problems with the villain's plan. No. No, it actually doesn't because the time frame doesn't actually matter to Bellwether's plan. Even if her plan didn't amount to instant fear, I would imagine she would continue at it until people started noticing because more and more people would go missing. Someone would notice! By attempting to balance the prejudice of certain characters and not giving enough development to characters like Bogo and Bellwether, Bogo because he doesn't believe trust Nick, and Bellwether because of the missing mal plan having too many obvious problems, we end up getting characters that don't use basic logic, which results in scenes that took way too long or weren't needed. I know you're about to bring up other examples beyond this point, and we'll cover those then. 
But I want to, once again, spotlight the issues with you calling Chief Bogo not trusting Nick or Bellwether's entire plan nonsensical and useless to the plot. In particular here, calling them so unneeded that it just results in useless scenes to the plot. But riddle me this, Kanan. What is so worthless about the two scenes that you allude to? The latter example is especially baffling to call worthless because Bellwether's plan is the reason we have a plot to begin with. Without her, we would just have a slice of life about Judy or Nick, whichever, which wouldn't make for a bad TV series or anime, but for a movie though, things kinda need to happen. So Bellwether's plan is imperative to the movie. That said, even the former example is strange, because the scene with Chief Bogo not taking the word of a random stranger doesn't even take up that much time. At best, this is hyperbole. The DMV scene could have been cut and Judy could have merely asked someone at the ZPD to run the license plate. Hell, she could have asked Otterton's wife who her husband worked for instead of not using common logic. Not when Mrs. Otterton wasn't there. Also, the DMV scene taking a long time? It, yeah, that was kind of the point. Judy asking Nick to help her run the plate and mentioning that she had a time limit to do so led to Nick trying to waste Judy's time so she would be farther from solving the case. He was attempting to be a foil in her plan, and this is ignoring me, she could have asked someone at the ZPD to do it for her because while logically I guess, once again it's reasonable to assume that she could have thought this to be the quicker option than running all the way back to the ZPD for someone else to do it there. Why wouldn't it be? And don't say because the DMV was run by sloths because Judy wouldn't have known that. Even the tame collar version had a better sloths are slow gap because it was far briefer and it still got the point across. At this point it's joke over function because these two bits are actually rather different. The tame collar version is merely a joke that we see while Nick is trying to get the funds for wild times, whereas the actual version is important to the plot. I also feel that the Mr. Big scene was also unnecessary because no kids will get the Godfather reference and it's unlikely the parents will either considering how old the movie is. I get that a lot of people have seen it, but it's not like everyone has. He wasn't even part of the Tame Collar version. Is... is that all you took from the Mr. Big scene? A Godfather reference and nothing more? Christ, Cayman. Were you paying attention during the scenes he was on the screen for? So the things that Mr. Biggs brings to the plot would make the movie arguably worse without him. Judy's heroism in trying to save his daughter from the donut would be ultimately redundant because it's not like the police were going to acknowledge that. It's the Mr. Biggs scene that pays off that moment by having the daughter pay that niceness forward. We wouldn't have the following scene with Manchus because it's Mr. Biggs that tells Judy and Nick to go ask him about Emmett's outburst and presumably where to find him. Judy and Nick also wouldn't get any information from Weaselton because it's Judy and Nick's newfound allyship with Mr. Biggs and a subsequent threat of icing Duke that he even confesses to giving the night howlers he stole earlier in the movie to Doug. Which leads us towards that scene. Like, what do you mean the scenes with Mr. Biggs could have been taken out of the film because they're a cheap Godfather joke? Did we watch the same Zootopia? I would hope so because I watched both. I'm going to get ready to start wrapping things up now. Slowly, but surely. I don't think that the final version of Zootopia is the worst film Disney has made. It's not their worst film when considering some of the Disney Toon movies, live action films, and remembering that one of the directors directed Ralph Breaks the Internet, which is far worse regarding the story and characterization. It's all around an insult to the original Wreck-It Ralph. If anything, when considering the unused version that's practically finished, this film is just a major disappointment when compared to it. Only if you don't pay attention to anything in the movie unless it's spelled out to you in neon lights. Judy isn't a very good cop, Certain characters don't get enough development, the villain's plan has way too many problems, and using stereotypes and prejudice just didn't work here. We're almost done, Susie. We're almost done. While the tame collars in the old version might have made things a little too obvious to some, at least things are more believable than what's presented in the final version. Only if you don't go in and nitpick everything on the level you do with the actual movie. Now I'm sure some of you in the comments might ask or wonder, why are you treating Zootopia's story so seriously, but not wreck it Ralph or Moana's story seriously? And that's because those movies lean far more into fiction than something like Zootopia. 
Aside from the anthropomorphic animals and the occasional breaks from physics, it doesn't have an awful lot of fantasy elements and it treats what's happening in the film as mostly realistic, whereas Ralph and Moana use far more fantasy elements than Zootopia, with the video game characters in Ralph and the omnipotent ocean in Moana. I mean, I guess it's less fantastical and more down-to-earth than Wreck-It Ralph or Moana, but that doesn't mean it's trying to be more realistic. I do have thoughts about this, but for the sake of not wasting my final thoughts when we only have six minutes left of this review, just keep it on the back burner for now. The missing mammal cases and prejudice are treated seriously, and yet despite this, the characters don't use basic logic for most of what's shown, or what's shown is unrealistic or straight up unbelievable. If only you were able to properly establish that throughout this review instead of just saying racism and logical, like no shit. E. N. D. M. Y. L. I. F. E. I also heard from few sites that Zootopia potentially has a bit of propaganda in it, and I only learned about the concept earlier this year. I'm going to be honest and somewhat agree with these claims. As I mentioned earlier, Judy only wants to be a cop to make the world a better place, and she more or less believes in the stereotypical role of taking down criminals instead of actually knowing what a cop is supposed to do. But she's horribly corrupt as she does so. What lowers it a bit is that she's the only one on the force who acts like this while almost everyone else is shown far more professional and Boga calls her out on her behavior and it nearly yet rightfully gets her fired. However, I feel that it leans back into propaganda with making Nick Judy's partner and having him join the ZPD. His friend is a cop, Cayman. Her sister was a witch. She came down in a bubble, Cayman. As I mentioned before, there were literally no signs that he had any interest in wanting to join the ZPD. Even in the tame collar version, there was nothing like that, and the whole thing felt incredibly forced onto the final version. I'll go as far as saying that it feels like an ass pull alongside Gideon's redemption. I am so tired. The whole thing reminds me of Kingdom of the Sun and how it was changed to the Emperor's new groove. The only difference is that it was changed because Pocahontas and Hunchback didn't make back as much money as they hoped, so instead of going for another serious work, they'd go for something more comedy based, despite getting a decent amount of the scenes for Kingdom of the Sun finished. The main difference is that the creators thought that Zootopia's old version was too dark and that it would possibly alienate people from seeing it. I was gonna say citation needed, but I was able to find something that explains why it was changed. And by the looks of it, it was just not the story the creators wanted to tell. It felt too dystopian and they didn't want to make the story that way. They changed the main character from Nick to Judy to give Judy something to think about regarding discrimination within herself. It's not that they felt like it was going to alienate people, they just weren't liking that direction. We have a good idea on what the Tame Collar version was going to be like, with many storyboards and concept art being pretty easy to find, and honestly, after seeing what it would have been like, it didn't feel as dark as they claimed it was. Okay, I really can't keep beating around the bush about this. I need to finally address my feelings about the Tame Collar version. Cayman, you're using fanfiction as your source. Most real fan of Minnie's compiled Tame Collar version is written in text form without much citation to it. They're using educated guesses to try to piece together everything to make a what would have been, but you can't really rely on that as a source since that's not the version that we actually got. There are some things that are confirmed, yes, but with what's not confirmed had to be guessed upon by Will Fan of Many to try to make things more coherent. And even then I think in execution the plot is horribly fucking paced and very on the nose, but that's just me. Furthermore, the stuff that has been confirmed wouldn't do the allegory justice. Sure, it'd be less confused, but it'd be far too close resembling eugenics to really give a modern edge to it. While researching for stuff previously brought up throughout this commentary, I actually found a pretty interesting viewpoint regarding Zootopia's allegory in contrast to what we would have gotten in the Tame Color version. And while for opinion pieces like this, I don't like just calling to someone else's thoughts on the matter. It doesn't usually make for good counter arguments since they tend to be pretty subjective. However, in this instance, I do think what they bring up within this article is something worthwhile and particularly relevant to this discussion in particular. To paraphrase, The tricky thing about writing an allegory about prejudice in which the minority group faces codified oppression is that it tends to evoke thoughts of historical injustices rather than present ones. It's not that Zootopia's anti-predator sentiment doesn't draw parallels to current issues, 
But there's a knee-jerk reaction in people to connect allegories of institutionalized injustice with past wrongdoings, perhaps because it's comforting to think that that sort of thing doesn't happen anymore. What makes the final cut of Zootopia so brilliant is that its depiction of prejudice is distinctly modern and therefore much more uncomfortable to deal with. The city of Zootopia is integrated and progressive enough that, on a superficial level, it appears that its citizens aren't prejudiced at all. Needless to say, if you've seen the movie, you know things are a lot more complicated. I can't imagine that Judy's openly anti-Fox sentiment would have had the same cringe factor as her condescension in calling Nick a real articulate fella, or that her revelation that it's wrong to forcibly call her 10% of the population would have been as heartbreaking and ugly as the moment Judy instinctively reaches for the Fox repellent and she and Nick realize that despite everything they've accomplished together, she is afraid of him. So, while personally I feel that the allegory can be a bit confused at times, as I pointed out, they kind of flip-flop of who the oppressed group is, plus I do kind of side-eye animal racism allegories to begin with, since animals are biologically different from one another, but that's another tangent for another day. I think this stance on the movie does kind of shed some light, though, on why it's important to have this movie be as low-key as it is. It's not enough to make Zootopia the eugenics cut, bludgeon you over the head with racism and bigotry bad with something that feels like it comes straight from the Third Reich. While the director has gone on record saying that they didn't even want to make a message movie to begin with, the fact that the racism feels passive-aggressive makes the message of the movie that much stronger. It adds to the self-reflection in Judy as she goes throughout the film. It makes the conflict of the film that much stronger, and it makes a lot of the things in this movie make sense. And mind you, this is only going off the stuff that we knew was going to happen in the Tame Caller version, not the stuff that the fanfiction tells us was going to happen. Honestly, the fact that the Tame Caller version was a talking point at all in an analysis of Zootopia as a film should have been a red flag to anyone who knew of it from the beginning, even disregarding the abundance of other issues this review has had since we started, but again, I'll save some of that more for my final thoughts. Basically, I think that the final version was too ambitious in what it was trying to do. I'm kind of surprised that they didn't make the movie a bit longer to explain things. Sure, this movie is almost an hour and 50 minutes long, but both Cars and The Incredibles are longer than it. Granted, not by much, but if they could make those movies nearly two hours long, then they could have made this one the same length or even longer. Incredibles and Cars are Pixar films. Honestly, I just kind of want this commentary done, so we're going to skip over the rest of his final thoughts, though frankly you aren't missing much, so I'm going to move on to my own final thoughts to wrap up this exhausting trip. So like, this has kind of been in the background the entire time, but during the criticisms regarding law enforcement, Kanan just kind of assumes that Zootopia's laws are equivalent to our own. But what's the likelihood that it is when we hear otherwise throughout the film? In regards to the criticisms of Bellwether's plan, how do we know how people have been reacting to Bellwether's plan when we're only seeing the mystery being solved? How do we know Judy would learn the colloquial term for night howlers when we don't really see the education system in Zootopia? Sure, you could argue that these things could be established with more world building, but these things ultimately wouldn't be important to the film if we just interacted with it on its own terms. Zootopia at the end of the day is a mystery story for children and families, and while that wouldn't excuse bad writing if Zootopia actually had bad writing, everything that you've nitpicked to hell and back wouldn't affect the story if we were to suspend their disbelief every once in a while and let the story breathe. Instances of bad writing would only be applicable if the things being pointed to do not make sense in the confines of the world that we do see, but you're having to do a lot of assuming to reach some of the conclusions that you have throughout this review. Even as far as Judy going back to the ZPD to run a plate, we don't know the rules of the ZPD. How do we know running a plate for someone not in the system wouldn't be breaking the law? It's not something that's established, and it probably could have been spelled out if need be, but with both Clawhauser and Judy mentioning that she does not have the resources to do so, since Judy's not in the system, we do have that to go on, and so we have to take that at face value. This is why I hate CinemaSins style content, and frankly why I've never really covered anything CinemaSins related on my channel in the past. Though, uh, spoilers, I actually do have some CinemaSins style content uh, for the future that I want to cover, but um, another day. I get that they nitpick for entertainment. I understand that they claim it's not for legitimate criticism, and I even understand that from an argumentative and critical stance, 
nitpicks aren't inherently wrong or invalid, but as far as media criticism goes, they never want to interact with a piece of media on its own terms. They try to nitpick whatever they can purely on their own terms, which usually becomes begging for less nuance and more tell, don't show, which would make for a less enjoyable experience, having everything spelled out for you as if you were two. Either that or they visually do not understand what's going on in the film. Not on the fault of the movie, but because of the critics' attention span getting in the way of their understanding of the media. Media criticism in general has become very illiterate, and Kamen's review unfortunately winds up being a really predominant example of that. And I don't want to be mean about it, since he directly came to me asking what my opinion on his video was, but there's frankly not a more honest way to put it. Throughout this video, Kamen begs for more elaboration from the movie not understanding what is and is not important for the film to actually tell its story, wanting more realism in a story that doesn't want to give realism, and even going as far as to use fan fiction as a point of reference on what it was that he was wanting from the movie instead. It makes it even worse when the realism he asks for actually is realistic, such as when Cayman goes on to talk about the police force knowing not of what the police actually do. He makes assumptions where assumptions do not need to be made, and he's super arbitrary with some of his criticisms at the end of the day. Like, the whole time skip criticism really is one of the worst criticisms Kamen had about this film. It just has zero barring on really anything, and it's really misrepresentative of what actually happens in the early stages of the movie. What I'm trying to say is, relying exclusively on nitpicks as your form of criticism does not make for good critique. I hope this was worth the wait, and I hope you were able to take something away from it. Have a good day, and take care. We've returned with the parts. Ah, good. Sugar and Echo are in the house cleaning up. They got us the quotes we need, and Zoelle and I are already almost done with the plan B, so it'll be good to get the parts to finish up plan A. You sure are efficient, isn't she, though? I try to be, for sure. In any case, you guys can go and rest in guest house now. We'll try to get this done by tomorrow. Oh, uh, okay. Boy, we got another one. Oh, who's this we have here? Oh, it's Miss Holiday herself. Shouldn't you have been banished cycles ago? Should, shouldn't have. Really, at the end of the day, shoulds mean nothing, don't they? Because what's important is the is -its that we're currently seeing. Man, that sounded loads more clever in my brain than it wound up being. Should we throw her in the queue? Yeah, sure. We snagged quite a number of them already by now. Okay, but before you throw me in with the rest of them, may I talk to you for a bit? Alone. Oh? Brave. But you know what? Sure. You two can go off and look for the remainder of the crew. So, you got something to tell me? Well, more like I want to make sure I understand this right. Go for it. So, you're wanting to make this ship a society by opening the gates to the ship without the knowledge or lead to do so. Well, yeah. You see, after being told that, it rubbed me the wrong way. You were never one to be the scheming type. I mean, you played your pranks, especially when you had my help during April Fools, but a full ship takeover doesn't sound like you. A lot can change when a person is locked away for as long as I have. Yeah, but I just don't believe that. Like, where even did this plan come from? Eh, a letter I got a hold of. Okay, but that doesn't answer my question. How did you know what was in the letter? You're being very nosy. But, if you must know, Essence was given the letter by Valerie, who gave it to Ginger. I went with her for a bit before Jasmine called me to her job room for uh, some assistance. We both were curious what the letter contained, and I guess Ginger read it to Essence, who told it to me. And you trusted... Essence. I mean, yeah, why wouldn't I? <sighs> no, you know what? Just put me in the box. Well, right. Now back to my regularly scheduled plot. Well, 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 if it ain't your mortgage, here to remove you from this plane of existence using our ultimate strategy. Okay, that's dangerously close to a nerve, and I'm a snail, so I'm probably gonna result in an- uh, the, 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 pff, Fuck. <laughs> Why did I write such stupid words? What, am I a fucking freak? God damn it. Ugh. <sighs>
Uh, you know, it's not a, it's not, it's not me recording for the police unless I fucking ingest some kind of substance while fucking trying to remember why I wrote the stupid bullshit. Oh my god, I remembered why I stopped smoking the bong. It's because I can't find my lighter. Susie! No, no, actually, I'm derailing this. Okay, if anyone has my Zippo lighter, if any of you, um, you fucking assholes has my goddamn Zippo lighter, give it back. I need it. I don't want to go and get the other one from my sister's room. It's scary in there. I need my red Zippo lighter back, and I dropped, I know I dropped it, so I have to, like, that's forfeiting it, but, like, it, give it back. Someone please give me back my lighter. Anyway, I'll back to the thing I said I'd do. <clears throat> well, well, if it ain't your mortgage, here to remove you from this plane of existence with our ultimate strategy. Okay, that's dangerously close to a nerve, and I'm a snail, so that's probably gonna result in an epileptic- <laughs> Epileptic! Fuck! Okay, that's dangerously close to a nerve, and I'm a snail, so that's probably gonna result in an epileptic Armageddon. So instead, why don't we take the suspect into custody to be suspected of being sus- <clears throat> Fuck! I was close. I was almost there. I'm gonna do the whole thing. It's one sentence. Okay, that's dangerously close to a nerve, and I'm a snail, so that's probably gonna result in an epileptic Armageddon. So why don't we just take the suspect into custody to be suspected of being suspiciously, 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 and then I just go on for a while. Um, like the whole joke was that like sus, like like the Among Us. Like, um, like, I don't know if you guys have played Among Us, but, like, in that game, um, there's an imposter, and the imposter is referred to as sus because it's, like, suspicious, but, like, a little bit smaller. Like, it doesn't take as much time to say, so they just abbreviate it to sus. Um, and, uh, this dude's, um, like, really, sh like, I, like, could you imagine going to Doodle Tones and being like, hey, can you please commentate on this video? I don't think it's up to par. And then it results in, like, fucking another snail walking in to her office. And I'm like, oh, hey, Gastrotones, what's good? And she's like, I don't want to fucking talk about it. I don't want to talk about it. I don't want to look at it. I don't want to see it. I don't want to smell it. I fucking do not want to smell it. And I'm like, okay. And then she, like, cries for a while. Why do you do this? Like, she didn't do anything. She didn't deserve this. She's not going to fucking, like, like, uh, she, uh, like... We've already got fucking Sonic Shadow out here ready to be, like, killed for crimes against humanity and Sarah Dust for being the sus- Oh, yeah, I forgot about- um, so, so Among Us, um, so when you're suspicious in Among Us, they have to, like, force you out by, like, voting you out, but you can, like, lie to them and be like, no, it's actually the other guy, so they try to, like, twist the narrative to make the other guy suspicious. It's really crazy. Anyway, I don't like it when Suzy, when when Gastrotones is depressed because um she's already got enough on her plate with like the fucking odd boys coming in and throwing out like <coughs> excuse me. Uh throwing out her girlfriend's fucking docs information. But like is uh, <sighs> Why? Do, like, this is, like, actually fucking a hate crime against lesbians and snails for you to fucking go to Susie and be like, hey, look at this. And now Gastrotones is here having to fucking throw all this shit in a blender and see if she can make any of this make sense. Fucking, this is stupid. I hope... Su Editor, keep all of this in. Keep every single bit of this in. I will be so sad if you don't. Actually, keep none of this. If this is in the video in any way, shape, or form... I'm going to activate my stand, and, um, I don't know if you know this, but, um, uh, I'm actually, and <laughs> I don't want to drop too much lore, actually, it's some fucking stupid outtakes, but it's really great, because, like, what they actually, what people don't realize about Gun Mario is that it's actually, 